Welcome back to the Mining Pod. I'm joined again by Matt Kimmel for this week's news roundup. We're talking about Genesis, which filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy late last night, late Thursday night. This is Friday recording time. We're also going to talk about how mining is being approached by a few different regions within the United States. We have some fresh information about how New Hampshire is looking to integrate Bitcoin mining to the grid. We also have a little new video from CNN talking about how a lot of people don't like Bitcoin mining and are taking their guns out to prove a point about it. We we'll start off with Genesis though, and yeah, really dive into that one. Matt, you called this one last week, though. To be fair, a lot of people called this quite a while ago, far before you did. But we'll give you some props, <laughs> regardless. Tell us about Genesis. I think I'll I'll take that as a compliment. Maybe it's not. um. All right, let's talk about the what we learned basically from last week, Gray. As you mentioned, uh, Genesis filed for Chapter Eleven. Sort of expected, but the sort of new um, news events was that DCG, right, the parent company, wound down their dividends, so they're no longer paying investors those. Um, reportedly, Coindesk, uh, another subsidiary of uh, DCG and your alma mater, is up for sale. And then um, the beloved uh, Justin Sun, um, the beloved scammer, I mean founder is offering a uh, billion dollars to help bail them out. Um, and in the chapter 11 filing, Genesis owes $3.5 billion, billion with a B, to creditors. Um, so this story is ongoing. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think the like 800 pound gorilla in the room question is, does this impact uh, DCG more broadly. And I mean, everything kind of points to, yes, at least to some degree, um, them no longer paying dividends. They wound down their three and a half billion dollar wealth management division, uh, in early January and Coindesk is now for sale, right? A subsidiary, a part of their venture portfolio, um, is out there. So they're definitely looking to sort of stir up their balance sheet, right? Looking to get some cash. And um, we'll just see how far that extends, right? How much trouble are they in? Because they have um, a, a big presence in the industry, right? They have a major venture portfolio. Um, and this is a mining pod, so it's worth mentioning the mining pool Foundry, the largest Bitcoin mining pool out there, is a subsidiary of DCG. So what are your thoughts, Will? Yeah, definitely a few things going on right now. We're going to have to like take a look through all this, probably make some written articles about the different ways that DCG's portfolio unwinding could affect the mining space. Foundry, of course, being the biggest one, like you said, they're the largest mining pool in North America. They also run some sites, I believe, and they also run a ASIC trading desk uh, and a few other things that they do. So like pretty awesome team over there. However, they are caught within this DCG Genesis crash cash crunch uh, the question here is, can Genesis restructure? They're trying to do so before May 19th, according to New Reuters article. DCG is sort of sitting on the sideline, not quite sure what their plan is to do. They owe Genesis about like $1.19 billion, I believe, is the number I last saw. Uh, so they're they're liable to Genesis because they just assumed a lot of uh, Genesis debt. And they also took a loan from Genesis in order to buy back shares. And I think also to make some venture portfolio moves. So DCG is not out of the woods either. Uh, they seem to be sitting on the sideline and they took the last few months in order to try to figure out how DCG could help out Genesis, but they succumbed to the inevitable, which was Genesis filing for bankruptcy. On the media news, Coindesk obviously is a big presence in the media space. A lot of miners uh, go through Coindesk in order to publish stuff and they have a pretty solid team there publishing mining news. This could be a big hit for Coindesk. They might have to be sold. They might just have to restructure, or go somewhere else. As of right now, we know from Wall Street Journal reporting that they have actually retained some investment bankers to help size up what a potential deal could look like. And this could have like pretty large implications for the crypto media space because you could either like be sold to another exchange, you could have another overlord, or maybe they like figure a way to be independent. But at, at the very least, like the largest crypto media site is probably going to go under different ownership is what it looks like right now. I'm really waiting to see what happens with the Foundry, though. Uh, we don't have any inclinations or understandings of what that subsidiary's portfolio looks like right now. Assume it's very strong just based on their growth. The fact that they've actually been purchasing assets over the last few months. So they purchased some stuff from Compute North uh, or the 
believe they purchased the ability to purchase some things from Compute North of uh, Chapter 11. So we'll see what happens. But we can leave it there unless you have any other thoughts. In terms well, of- I was just going to say, the CoinDesk news is huge, right? They're the ones who really broke the, the FTX news. Um, and like all this reporting is so important in crypto. I'll just note, there's a couple, uh, some potential people that could be impacted that are on the creditor list. I should say the top creditors of... Um, you know, seven being owed seven hundred sixty six million, four hundred sixty two million, two hundred thirty million. Um, they are not clear yet. Um, that information hasn't come out. We can assume that one of those is Gemini, right? Based off of how the story has really unfolded. But some of the ones that we do know, um, uh, Crypto Project Decentraland uh, is fifty million. Abra in exchange, and I don't really think they'll be super affected by this because it's about a it's a bite size thirty million. Stellar, kind of a zombie coin at this point, 13 million. And then um, Bitso, uh, another exchange, 10 million. Uh, so we'll see how it kind of plays out. I'm really interested to see who those bigger players are. And then you mentioned the sort of $1.1 billion uh, like promissory note. Really going to be interesting to see the terms of that. Um, the Winklevoss twins originally accused... Uh, DCG of committing accounting fraud, fraud because of that note, and they're already under SEC and DOJ uh, investigation or charged with unregistered securities fraud. So, I don't know. This story is going to continue. It's it's like pretty convoluted. It's kind of difficult to unwrap. But the the big question is how does this affect DCG, the portfolio companies, and Bitcoin broadly? Even though Bitcoin's hasn't taken a hit at all, you know, it seems like most of the speculation. Um, it's kind of flushed out of the market. It's kind of holding strong at 21K at the moment. Yeah, it's it's weird to see Bitcoin's price staying pretty stable during this. Maybe it's because people expected Genesis to go under uh, for quite a while now. They halted withdrawals back in early November. Yeah, the last thought I'll have on it is the cost of debt is only going up with that federal fund rate continuing to go up towards the 5% terminal rate they're looking at. I think it's at like 4.75 right now, but they're promising to continue increasing that rate through most of this year. And that means like a lot of this debt that's on people's portfolios is just going to become more expensive to service. It's going to tie up cash flows and you're going to see people just continue to be uh, squeaking by if at all. Um, so different scenario there. And then for all these large companies that are trying to unwind their bad positions, think Core Scientific, think Genesis, DCG and others, it's just going to be a mess. So that's what I'm looking at right now. But let's move over and talk about how Bitcoin mining is being looked at in the States. So we have two uh, news articles about this, one from CNN and one from Bitcoin Magazine talking about how uh, the New Hampshire legislature has been looking at Bitcoin mining as a way to improve the grid. I'll hand over the Bitcoin Magazine one to you and then I'll follow up with the CNN in a second. Yeah, so essentially the New Hampshire story is that the gover- governor came out and cited the positive impacts that Bitcoin mining could have on the electricity grid. This is something that you know the listeners to this pod are probably experts on and, and widely understand, but seeing it from a state legislator is uh, really refreshing um, and you know potentially really helpful for the mining industry in that state. We know it's going to be sort of a state's rights issue as it's, as it's been historically. Um, so I guess you should say the other side of the coin here, which is going on in North Carolina. What was that story? Well, yeah, so we have this new video from CNN that came out over the week. Let's take a look at it really quickly and then dive into it. How do you describe that noise? So we're probably sitting at a probably 65 decibels right now when it's at about 75, 80 decibels. I'd say a jet engine, a jet engine that never leaves. 16 months after the mine fired up without warning. Mike Lugovic put his house up for sale in frustration. There'd be turkeys out in the field and, and deer by the hundreds. Yeah. You don't have that anymore. While Tom Lash misses the wildlife. He don't sleep at night. Phyllis Cantrell says she feels trapped. You can actually lay your head on the pillow and hear it hum up through the walls. No have you thought about moving? We're 73 years old. Where are we gonna go? So it's a pretty powerful video. Uh, I, we can only show a second of it here, just a clip of it, but definitely go take a look at it. We'll include it in today's show notes. Uh, the story here is that in North Carolina, there's a new Bitcoin mining uh, site and it's 
not zoned well for whatever reason. Maybe they just don't have a local regulation set up to do that, and it's affecting people's lives. Having this constant droning noise nearby your neighborhood is really annoying. There's a reason why Bitcoin mining is more industrial. It's typically zoned in industrial parks where that noise can be contained or with other sources of industrial noise. And in these rural regions, which don't have a lot of heavy industry, but Bitcoin mining can move to, you're getting some problems between localities and the Bitcoin mining operators. Uh, to me, this story just tells you about like a growing industry that's still trying to figure out how to survive. Like 90% of operational expenditures are from energy. So they go where energy is cheap. Oftentimes energy is cheap near residential zones or just near zones where people live for whatever reason. That's just how the transmission lines break down or where the cheap energy is. And so you get these problems where there's like frustration or confusion between the two sides. And the Bitcoin miners often are welcomed in at first because they would create jobs for the area or add this new technology to the area people are interested in. And then 12 months into it, the region is like, hey, we didn't expect this to be super loud or this to be really annoying, or we didn't expect this to take so much energy from the grid. So to me, this is like a big story about education. Uh, I think for walk away for me is like Bitcoin miners, don't just think about uh, your cost, but also think about zoning and where you should be appropriately placed because you shouldn't really be next to a residential neighborhood. Like we see a lot of these stories and the reality of it is that no one wants this droning noise by your house at all, right? So find somewhere else to park your mind because your mind still matters and it's so important to the region. You're going to add jobs to the region, which is really important, but uh, just be careful about where you place your facility. Um, this is a story near and dear to my heart because in, in university, I was trying to mine out of my uh, out of my apartment and my roommates were not enthused by a sound but yeah this just in right like miners are loud the cyber hornets you can hear them yeah um yeah i think it's really just these two stories coming out at the same time is like a really interesting juxtaposition like we know that um the mining industry could help employ people and bring jobs and have potentially really profit really beneficial side effects for the energy grid right to subsidize renewables to capture stranded waste energy all these things we know near and dear, but when things are actually implemented in practice, um, there's potentially downsides uh, as well, such as the noise to neighboring people. And we know like this could be dealt with, like um, I've heard of several miners like putting in um, insulation in the walls of, of like a unit to try to reduce the noise. Uh, I think it's like an ongoing science of how to do this in, in the best way. But it's just something definitely, as you said, to be mindful of um, as you're starting up a farm. But yeah, state by state, right? People are going to think differently about Bitcoin mining. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think the New Hampshire story is cool because you get this understanding that Bitcoin mining could be important for grids, uh, for however you want to phrase it, being a reservoir for energy, being a battery on the grid, or whatever allegory metaphor you want to use, metaphor, I should say. Uh, it's important, right? That's That's a good thing. But on the flip side, you have to be mindful about where you're putting your operation. So we'll leave it there. Matt, great to see you again. See you next week. Probably more news about Genesis next week, I assume. But for everyone listening, thanks for giving us uh, a hearing here. Give us a shout on social media at our Twitter handles and give us a like on, uh, on the show as well. Appreciate your time. See you, Matt. Cheers.